Among the most iconic cartoon characters, Bugs Bunny is definitely up there as he continues to be an appealing animated presence many decades after his debut. But what is it about this wascally wabbit that has allowed him to stand the test of time and continue to entertain new generations? Bugs was the result of many minds at the Warner Brothers cartoon studio, and evolved quite a bit before he got to the version we now know and love. An early prototype for a mischievous rabbit character appeared in the Porky Pig cartoon Porky's Hair Hunt, released in 1938. Another rabbit would appear in the Chuck Jones cartoon Presto Changeo, and then one closest to his final form in Harem Scarum, directed by Ben Bugs Hardaway and Carl Dalton. The name Bugs Bunny originated with character designer Charlie Thorson, who wrote it on the model sheet to indicate it was intended for Hardaway's unit. The rabbit would also appear in an Elmer Fudd cartoon, Elmer's Candid Camera, in which Elmer tries desperately to take his photo. The first official appearance of Bugs Bunny is considered a wild hare, directed by Tex Avery. This is where the familiar elements of Bugs start to take shape. We get the classic scenario of Elmer hunting rabbits and coming across Bugs who messes with him. This was also the origin of his iconic catchphrase, What's up, Doc? which Avery said was a common saying in Texas. Bob Gibbons redesigned the character, and Mel Blanc provided him with a Brooklyn-like accent. When recording the scenes where Bugs munched on a carrot, Blank would do the same during the sessions and then spit them out before continuing the rest of the dialogue. A major inspiration for Bugs was the Frank Capra movie It Happened One Night, with him calling to mind Clark Gable, including a scene where he eats a carrot. The character became an immediate hit with audiences, and A Wild Hair was even nominated for an Oscar for Best Animated Short. Throughout his various shorts, Bugs would usually encounter someone who would bother him by trying to catch or kill him or do any other thing to annoy him, to which he would declare, you realize, of course, this means war. Then the rest of the cartoon would have him humiliate and defeat his opponent in a variety of clever ways. Elmer Fudd would be a popular foe, but he would also go up against Yosemite Sam, Marvin the Martian, and even Wile E. Coyote would take a break from trying to catch the Roadrunner to eat Bugs a few times. However, there were occasions when Bugs himself would get embarrassed by others. In a couple of cartoons, he faced off against the cunning mind of Cecil Turtle, with him usually beating Bugs. In What's Cookin' Doc, he makes a desperate plea to the Academy to give him an Oscar. In the end, he's hit with fruits and vegetables and an imitation Oscar rather than the real thing. I mentioned Clark Gable as a possible influence earlier, but I've long gotten more of a Humphrey Bogart vibe from him. An animated version of Bogart even interacts with Bugs a few times in the cartoon Eight Ball Bunny, and Bugs will later play Rick Blaine in the Casablanca parody Carrot Blanca. Bugs was popular with many of the Warner Brothers cartoon directors, with Tex Avery, Bob Clampett, Chuck Jones, Robert McKimson, and Fritz Freeling all taking turns in making Bugs Money cartoons. That's the reason why Bugs is not associated with any one specific director, and Jones and Freeling even took issue with Clampett referring to himself as the creator of Bugs Money, as the character was more of a group effort who evolved and changed through multiple hands at the studio. Each director did a great job in their respective Bugs cartoons, but when I think of the character in which shorts I find to be among his most iconic, it's often the Chuck Jones ones. One thing he particularly liked to do was pair Bugs with a story related to classical music. One of his best cartoons is Long Haired Hair, where an opera singer reacts angrily and violently to Bugs' music playing, so he puts on a conductor's uniform in a parody of Leopold Stokowski and messes with the singer. It's hilarious short, and that image of him getting the singer to hit the high notes is one I often associate with Bugs. There was also Rabbit of Seville, which features several wonderful gags and character animation set to Rossini's The Barber of Seville. Meanwhile, Walt's opera doc would summarily pair up a confrontation between Bugs and Elmer with a famous opera, this time set in a fancy world and brilliantly combining the dramatic themes of the piece with the comical bits. There are even people who could not hear a portion of Ride of the Valkyries without being reminded of Elmer Fudd repeatedly singing Kill the Wabbit. I think one of the best decisions Chuck Jones ever made was creating the feud between Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, starting with the short Rabbit Fire. Turning Daffy to someone jealous of Bugs and constantly trying to one-up him led to a great dynamic between the two, and it's always fun seeing them go head-to-head -head with each other. Jones would follow Rabbit Fire with two more cartoons where Bugs and Daffy deal with Elmer, forming the Hunting Trilogy. Meanwhile, in Duck and Muck, my personal favorite Loon Tunes cartoon, Bugs is revealed to be the animator constantly messing with Daffy. This pairing of Bugs and Daffy would absolutely be instrumental in that duck earning his place as one of the best cartoon characters ever conceived. Frizz Freeling seemed to particularly enjoy having Bugs go up against Yosemite Sam in several cartoons, with one of them, Nine Night Bugs, becoming the only Bugs Bunny cartoon to win an Oscar. Starting in 1960, he was the headlining star of The Bugs Bunny Show, which reran the theatrical cartoons on ABC for several decades. Bugs Bunny would star in several cartoons during the golden age of animation until False Hair, which became the last short produced by Warner Bros. cartoons when the studio decided to shut down the animated shorts unit in 1964. Warner Brothers would instead commission to Patty Freely Enterprises to make new Looney Tunes cartoons, although none of them starred Bugs. 
Wally Cody, the Roadrunner, Daffy Duck, and Speedy Gonzales were the ones given attention during this period. In fact, Bugs would not appear in a theatrical short until Box Office Bunny in 1991. Bugs would make a return to screens with the television special Bugs and Daffy's Carnival of the Animals in 1976, the first in a series of animated specials starring Bugs for CBS, which would also include Bugs Bunny's Easter special and even Bugs Bunny in Space. Warner Brothers would eventually bring the Looney Tunes back to theaters in a series of compilation films. The first of these, the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner movie, has Bugs serve as a host as he walks through his mansion and talks about the history of cartoon comedy, while also paying tribute to the directors who made some of the featured shorts. Later compilation films were created connecting story as a way to package these classic cartoons. Bugs would get the chance to appear alongside Mickey Mouse and Who Framed Roger Rabbit as part of a unique agreement Disney made with Warner Brothers. WB would only allow Bugs to appear in the film if he was given the same exact amount of screen time and lines as Mickey, and so the filmmakers decided to just have them be in the same scene together. I have to wonder what the reaction for the audience was in 1988 when the scene played and these iconic cartoon characters from different studios shared the screen for the first time. Sadly, this would be one of the last times Mel Blanc voiced Bugs, along with compilation film Daffy Duck's Quackbusters, as he would pass away in 1989. What a legacy of classic cartoon voices he would leave behind, and the several actors who have voiced Bugs in the years since have absolutely honored the iconic work he did. The first actor to voice Bugs after Blank's passing was Jeff Bergman, who'd impressed Blank years earlier with his Loon Tunes impressions. He first voiced Bugs at the Oscars, and then continued to provide it in the anti-drug crossover special Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue, the opening of Gremlins 2 The New Batch, and on Tiny Toon Adventures, where Bugs is a mentor to Buster and Babs Bunny. Other voice actors who had voiced Bugs in shorts and other projects included Greg Burson and Joe Alasky. Of the people who voiced Bugs and the other Loon Tunes after Blank, Alasky will probably always be my favorite. He did a phenomenal job of capturing those characters' familiar voices, doing extremely well with the humorous and even the rare heartfelt scenes. For the live-action animated hybrid movie Space Jam, Billy West voiced Bugs and did a solid job. Although I tend to agree with Chuck Jones' assessment of Bugs in the movie and that he should not have to go pleading to Michael Jordan for help to defeat some aliens. Joe Alasky would then voice Bugs in the next theatrical movie, Looney Tunes Back in Action, and I really like how this movie explores the friendship between Bugs and Daffy. For all the trouble Bugs gives Daffy, he still recognizes him as an important part of the Looney Tunes family, and especially his role in the cartoons that they have together. They have a great dynamic here, with several funny and nice scenes. Warner Brothers was planning a big comeback for the Looney Tunes at the time of Back in Action, including new shorts. However, when it flopped, those plans were scrapped, as they seemed to think the general audience had moved on from the characters. Disney is frequently doing new projects with Mickey Mouse and his friends, and yet WB has occasionally struggled with what to do with their own iconic animated characters, including the mascots so often associated with the studio. There will be a few attempts to revitalize the characters in the 2010s. One of them was the animated series The Looney Tunes Show, which went for more of a sitcom format. It turned Bugs and Daffy into roommates, with Bugs basically acting as the straight man reacting to Daffy's shenanigans. While the show had its flaws, I do think enough funny moments came out of it. The best element was turning Lola Bunny into a crazy stalker girlfriend. In addition to finally giving Lola an actual personality missing in previous incarnations, it led to a hilarious dynamic as Bugs deals with Lola's wacky behavior. Lola being like this was perfectly in sync with the Loon Tunes brand of humor, and it was funny seeing Bugs not knowing what to make of her wild antics. The relationship would be given its own movie in the directed video production, Rabbit's Run, which I quite enjoyed and featured several funny gags. Although while Jeff Bergman voiced Bugs again, they were not able to get Kristen Wiig back as Lola. The movie did not seem to get much attention, but I think it's worth a look. Bergman would also voice Bugs in Wabbit, a Looney Tunes production, later retitled New Looney Tunes, which put Bugs back into his rabbit hole. The show placed him in all sorts of scenarios reminiscent of his classic shorts, and many of these episodes were quite funny. After the show ended, a new one with a similar format began, titled simply Looney Tunes Cartoons. This one went really old school with the designs, taking particular inspiration from Bob Clampett. The wackier, more exaggerated style led to a heightened energy which I think benefited these shorts greatly. I've liked the various redesigns of Bugs Bunny over the years, but there is something fun about seeing him with this retro 1940s inspired look again. Eric Bauza also does a great job voicing Bugs and adding to the great list of actors who have taken on the mantle since Mel Blanc. After many years of speculation, a Space Jam sequel was also released in 2021. A new legacy was largely disliked by critics and even fans of the first movie thought it was an insult, decrying it for the commercialization and the acting of its lead basketball star. Which confused me, because Space Jam was also heavily commercialized, and Michael Jordan's acting was not what I would call good. For me, I thought the best parts of this movie were the Looney Tunes, which were all animated, and I even enjoyed the bits where they were inserted into other Warner Brothers movies. What I did not care for was the material of LeBron James and his family and the main villain. Sorry if what I want to see in the Looney Tunes movie 
are the Looney Tunes. The whole concept of Space Jam just does not appeal to me. While there have been a few new Looney Tunes projects, like a Tiny Toons revival, their treatment at WB these past few years has not been ideal, as anyone who's followed the news about Coyote vs. Acme is aware of. Hopefully things sort themselves out soon and someone high up at WB realizes the importance of these characters. When even Jack Warner, who did not pay much attention to the animation unit, aside from check-ins that they were staying on budget, looks more respectful in comparison to David Zlazov, that's saying a lot. Regardless of what happens in the future, there's a reason Bugs Bunny has remained so beloved throughout his many appearances. From his general attitude to his playful spirit, he has earned his place as not just an animation icon, but a comedy legend in his own right. From the moment he pops out of his rabbit hole, you know you're in for some big laughs. See you next time.